Welcome to the Exponential Minds Podcast. The research, development, launch, and growth of new technologies is creating incredible momentum in the modern world. Join futurist Nicholas Badminton as he talks with the innovators and the exponential minds that are tackling some of the biggest problems and creating solutions that are propelling humanity to the next level. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Exponential Minds podcast. My name is Nicholas Badminton, my futurist travels the world and uh, traveling the world virtually at the moment from, from my home base in Toronto, speaking to some of the world's best companies, biggest thinkers and speakers about the future. And today, I'm incredibly excited to chat to someone I met uh, about two or three years ago in Vancouver, at the, the VR and AR Global Summit. Uh, her name is Kathy Hackle. She's a leading female futurist and business strategist specializing in the impact emerging technologies of augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence and other areas and, and really trying to help us understand how they're having an impact on communications and business. She's worked in enterprise strategy, innovation, marketing strategy and business evangelism with some of the biggest brands in the world like UPS, HCC Vive, Tony Pictures, Adobe and most recently Magically. Hi Kathy, how are you? Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming on board and you're down in Washington DC. I hope that you're safe down there. And uh, really, what what this podcast is about is it's it's us getting to know you and us talking about some really important thinking in these areas about augmented reality, virtual reality, brain computer interfaces as well. That's that's really exciting for me. Can you just give us a little bit of your background, how you ended up getting to where you are today? Because you know you're now a futurist, and you, you've kind of always been a futurist, but you know, you've gone into education and really been like flexing those muscles, but how'd you get to here? Yeah, so my goodness, I feel like I've always been a futurist. I just didn't know that that word yeah. existed or that career path existed, let's say. So um arrived to it like many people, uh, just out of pure luck. But I will say, so the VR, because I've been in, in the merging tech for about five years now, I arrived at virtual reality and augmented reality um, I would say that I arrived to it via journalism and via storytelling, which is what I first did as my first career many, many moons ago. So um, back in 2004, I was working for CNN, and part of my job was to look at all the raw footage that was coming in from the war in Iraq. So, you know, I feel like I was a Facebook moderator before there were Facebook moderators. Uh, you know, I had to see horrible things, that sort of thing. And when you have that type of job, you have to kind of dial your hum humanity switch off just a little bit, you know, to kind of get by. And fast forward to five years ago, I went to a conference. I got invited to put a VR headset on. I went into an experience called Confinement by The Guardian, which you know, six by nine meter solitary confinement cell where prisoners spend 90% of their time. And within, within minutes, um, I was claustrophobic. Something clicked. I took the headset off and I said, this is a very powerful tool for telling stories. And this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And it was pivotal. It was, um, you know, it was transformative, to be honest. And, you know, fast forward, you know, a lot of work in between, but fast forward five years and here I am. Yeah, it, it's very rare that we have these experiences these days with technologies. And I feel that virtual reality and augmented reality is one of those technologies that once you take a step into that world, you can't see the world the same way. A hundred percent for me, it changed my view. Um, you know, I always talk to people in the AR, VR industry or XR, which is another, you know, term people use. And I always say that, you know, as XR people, we all have our X origin stories, XR origin stories. So um, definitely transformative technology. And through the work in emerging tech, I eventually got hired to be a futurist at a studio in Atlanta and slowly realized what, you know, what futurism was, what foresight was. And, um, and I've been able to kind of combine both. And it's been, it's been really interesting. Yeah, because, uh, you know, on, on these, on the edges of, of, of foresight and futurism, you know, when you look, look to the horizons and you're looking out five, 10, 20 years, you know, the, the technologies of augmented reality, I always talk about from rectangles to reality. 
you know, we walk around looking at these rectangles in our pockets. We're talking on a rectangle now, mm -hmm. you know, and it, and, it, and it lacks so much. And in, in this world of the pandemic and, and Zoom meetings, I mean, we, we're just finding, you know, why is it so draining? Why do, we, why do we still feel that we're not having great connections? Why have I had all these cocktail hours with all these friends? And at the end, why, why do I feel a little empty? rather than feeling like I've had a, an amazing experience, right? Yeah, and I think that, you know, when you start doing social VR, what's called social virtual reality, where you put on a headset, and instead of going, you know, to see something on Google Earth or draw something, when you're put in a social um, kind of environment, what I have found is when I spend time in social VR that I feel great. I feel like take the, I take the headset off after a while, but... I feel like I was actually at a party or actually at an event and, um, you know, and it, it re-energizes me. I'm the type of person, I like being around people. That's kind of where I get some of my energy. Um, so definitely social VR has helped me during this pandemic time kind of cope with that, you know, need for people. So that's really interesting. And we should probably go down this a little bit. Like social VR, I mean, I know Facebook and obviously they bought mm -hmm. um, Oculus back in the day and they're still pretty much dilly dallying around not really tr knowing you know what their virtual reality future will be or certainly not telling anyone specifically and they've got their, their, their they've got their virtual reality social piece which starts to like look pretty interesting um we've, we've kind of got this weird world where Fortnite has sort of dipped us into a sort of a virtual reality experience with people like marshmallow and, and travis scott doing these amazing sort of get togethers i was working with a client a couple of weeks ago and uh I put the Travis Scott concert in, in an, as an example for a re real estate business selling property. Yeah. And both of the people on the call had spent three hours in Fortnite with their kids the weekend before waiting for the Travis Scott event to happen. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. It's compelling. It's compelling. It's, it's but, compelling. But, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, we've got the prototypes, we've got, we've got the passion and the will to make social VR happen. We've got the people on the edges like yourself dipping in. When's this going to go big time? I think we still need to wait a little bit. I feel, you know, I feel with video games and social VR, I feel like, okay, this is how I feel. If when you ask Tim Sweeney, the CEO of Epic, there's a quote from him from end of last year. And he said, right now, Fortnite is a game. Ask me in 12 months, right? Because he sees the long view. He's, he's playing the long game. He knows that, yeah, it's a video game, but, it's more than that. It's a virtual, you know, it's a place where you're going to have virtual presence and you're going to have virtual concerts and you're going to have virtual real estate and in so much more. Right. So, um, so I do see that, you know, I, when is it going to happen? I'm not sure. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I, I see this pandemic as an accelerant um, to adoption of a uh, further adoption of virtual presence etc. I don't necessarily see it as the end all be all or, you know, the moment for the killer app or whatever people say. I think it's, it's you know, it's important in the history of VR and AR, but it's not the end all be all. Um, you know, I still think that there needs to be a lot more adoption. Headsets need to get better. Um, price is pretty good. You know, they might, you know, lower prices will probably be good. Um, yeah, until there's not further penetration from a VR standpoint, we probably won't be there yet. Um, I do like what I'm seeing with like Fortnite, uh, Roblox, for example. My kids spend because they're they're a little bit young for Fortnite, so they're all about Roblox and Minecraft. And um, and just the other day, I was talking to them and I said, guys, what is Roblox to you? And Roblox, in essence, is kind of a you know a video game, and there's user generated content. But they said, oh, mom, it's a community. The first thing they said is it's a community. They didn't say it was a video game. And that to me was impactful because I see this whole acceleration into virtual presence and, and kind of further merging our digital and our physical lives. Yeah, and it, it is, these are communities where we can be something fantastical and different and something truly, tr truly more than who we are. You know, it's that transhumanist sort of thing. Suddenly, you know, you put, you put on a VR headset. And I mean, I always think back in the day, you know, we're looking through the rectangle at Second Life, right? And then uh, friends were yeah. developing in Janus VR. 
And now we're sort of, okay, Facebook and maybe, you know, Fortnite and the, the long game. But yeah, Roblox, Minecraft. It's interesting how, and we were talking about this early, earlier, 1968, 1969, Doug Engelbart comes out with the first personal computer. Then we've got the sort of Damocles, the first sort of virtual reality prototype. I think that was the, uh, was it the Air Force, I think, uh, sort of developed that in, in the early days? It was, and, in a it was in one of the universities, but definitely, you know, it got um, started getting you know used by the Air Force uh, early on. I and, and then let me just tell you a side story. So I'm married to an aerospace engineer. Uh -huh. So when I started working in AR and VR, he would laugh and he would say, "Honey, we've had this. We've had AR and helmets for a very long time. This ain't nothing new, right?" right. <laughs> so um, so I always find that very interesting. You know, there's a very long history. Yeah, but but one of those helmets is like four hundred and fifty thousand dollars or something, right? I got to try one on. Yeah. At, a, at an Air Force event here in, in Washington, D.C. And, you know, it was, it was pretty heavy. They're custom made for the pilots. Um, but what I will say is that, you know, normally like uh, an actor has a red carpet moment at the Oscars where they're wearing millions of dollars of jewels. And they're like, who are you wearing? Right. That was for me, my red carpet moment. It's like, I'm actually wearing a $450,000 helmet. This is insane. <laughs> um, you know, and those helmets are you know, as I understand it, like if they look down at the, let's say the floor of the airplane, um, it, it would look transparent to them and they would actually be able to see the ground, um, you know, through cameras, of course, and all that kind of stuff. But it's mind blowing technology. Yeah, I mean, and that's amazing, right? And, you know, everything comes from military funding. Let's be honest, like if we're going to look to the future of of you know the edges of research you look to DARPA if you look at, at the the lineage of patents and technologies in in an iPhone it all comes from military um, computers like military military funding is, is you know unfortunately maybe fortunately sort of uh, turned its turned its like angle towards these technologies that are, enable the theater of war you know protect us save us service what, whatever you want to say and sometimes you know act against us but it, it's interesting when we look at that and we look at augmented reality virtual reality and it's been taken very seriously i think the the conference we we're at the head of uh, virtual reality for nasa was there and they've been using it forever and they still use it and it's got incredible value but when, when you've got the average person on the street you know it's 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 a game or it, it's, a, it's a community, and, and it hasn't seemed to flourish beyond media and gaming. But where are we? Because now we've crossed over into this world of mixed reality, augmented reality, what you wanna, whatever you wanna call it, glasses where you can see things in the real world and you're still in the real world. You know, where are we going? I mean, we've, we've had a lot of promises from a lot of people, but we don't seem to have made much progress. I think we've been early, you know, we've been, I think, you know, I'll give you an example. And you mentioned that I used to work for Magic Leap, right? I, I recently was part of a group of amazing pioneers and technologists, you know, that got laid off, sadly, from the company. Um, but I feel that in some ways, we were trying to solve such a hard technical problem, you know, that, that was really hard. But also, we might have been too early, you know, might have been too early to the game. And um, I found a lot of solace, to be honest, after the layoff, watching a documentary called General Magic, which I'm sure you know. Yes. And, you know, in case no one has watched it, definitely suggest you watch it. Um, about being a little too early, you know, seeing the future and kind of having the future in your hands in some way, but being a little too early to be able to kind of deploy that. Um, so, so I, you know, I, I'm excited to see what comes from there. Uh, if you watch General Magic, you know, you'll, you'll learn that a lot of people that came from that startup, you know, uh, went on to create Android, went on to create LinkedIn, went on to create the iPhone and the iPod, um, like all these things. So I, I kind of think about that. I'm like, everyone that I worked with at Magic Leap, what is going to come from there? You know, because they were just, you know, just visionaries and people were just that we're excited about the vision and extremely smart people. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and an incredibly well-funded group of smart people as well. <laughs> and, and this is it. I, you know what? When I first saw the the initial promises, I think it was like a Wired article, and I I, I can't remember if it was Kevin Kelly that you know wow. later on he spoke about the mirror world, but early on, like Kevin Kelly, I think was 
maybe one of the people talking about Magic Leaf and it was the opening hands and the, the, the flying pink elephant or something like that, right? And then it was the, the whales. And then I used to embed, you know, some of these gifts into my presentation. It's like, here's the future. And by all promises, the technology existed to be able to do exactly that. But we forget, you know, software is kind of easy and you can build it out. But when you're dealing with what is a entirely new paradigm of processing, right? And this is the brain computer interface, visual, you know, using the visual cortex, using entirely new ways of, you know, refracting lenses. You know, we, we've heard about the beast and the cheese head. We've heard about all these stories about Magic Leap. They're out in the public domain now. But it was a thing of law. And, you know, it was, it was like, put your head in this and take a look. And people would just give them a lot of money, you know, Google and a number of other companies. And it was because it was incredible. The promise was incredible. I kind of feel that augmented reality and virtual reality has had this huge promise that goes beyond gaming, right? And we, we even see, like, I mean, you mentioned, like, Roblox, Minecraft. Look at Pokemon Go when that first came out. And I installed it, and I was walking around Vancouver, where I was living at the time, and I walked... I tell the story about how I walked across like, you know, four junctions without taking, looking up from my, you know, my, my iPhone in, in my hand. And it was like, oh my God, like I didn't get run over. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> uh, maybe I've got this wider sense around me uh, when I'm sort of in, in the computer zone uh, and uh, the augmented reality zone and being able to be in the world. But, you know, we're, we're still struggling. I mean, this technology, technology things are really, really hard. The, the Air Force helmet is probably 25 years of development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, because I always, always get that question, when is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? Like, if someone tells you when it's going to happen, you know, don't believe them because this is going to take some time. There's a lot of different factors that need to happen for things, for it to be mainstream, right? Yes, I'm looking forward to when Apple releases whatever it is that they're working on, right? right. I'm looking to forward to whatever it is that Facebook brings to the market. Um, so we just kind of have to wait a little bit. Um, you know, to go back to to a little bit of the Magic League conversation, um, you know, for me, it was a really transformative time. Uh, I would walk around the um, headquarters and, um, you know, there's, for example, something called the gestural, gestural lab. And you would see people in there and you just felt something special was happening. And then when I talked to, uh, to futurists and I say, oh, the, our chief futurist was Neil Stevenson. That's right. Like Neil Stevenson. I mean, I didn't work directly with him, but he was a colleague. We were both in the same organization. So, you know, it attracted amazing people with, with visions and of the future, et cetera. So, you know, when is it all going to change? I'm not sure. You know, I, I wonder, I see the pandemic as an accelerant, but I also see it as a moment where we need to kind of step a little back because investments in, you know, startups, that's going to be an issue. Um, you know, deploying some of these technologies um, might be an issue. I'll give you an example. When I think of location-based entertainment, using VR and AR, it's probably not a place that people are going to want to go, you know. In, in the next couple of months? Like, do I really want to go to, um, you know, somewhere like the void or, or something like that and put on a headset? I mean, they're going to do their best to clean them and sanitize them. But, you know, is my first instinct going to go want to share a headset with someone? Hmm. Probably not. Right. So I think that, yeah, we're going to see, we're going to see a lot of good things come from it, but we also need to take a pause right now. Yeah, and it's it's interesting what I've seen over the years. I mean, I, I read an article earlier today, and they're saying that you know funding for startups in VR and AR is is dropping back to really low levels. I think it was 20, 2013, 2015 levels, and it's like okay, but things are cheaper today, so let's not get too excited. They say that about renewable energy, electric vehicles, whatever. But at the at the same time, when we when we're looking at this development, if you look at the a similar pathway of uh, mobile phone technology. You had lots of players, and then you had very few players and very dominant uh, operating systems, Android and OS, iOS, right? And now we've got like China coming in with more head, more handsets and whatever, and they're taking advantage of, of those ecosystems. Is that is that where we're going to end up? Are we going to end up with like Facebook, Apple, uh, Google? 
and Microsoft slugging it out for, for domination. And, and, you know, I'll be chatting to you and you'll be like, you know what, I'm a, I'm a Microsoft AR person. And I'm like, no, I'm an Apple AR person, right? And someone else is like, you know, I'm a Google AR person. And, and suddenly, you know, we are going to have these new exciting worlds, but uh, complete incompatibility again. I mean, it could happen. It could definitely happen. I always think about the idea of what kind of household are you, right? My household is an iOS household, right? If you bring a Samsung, Samsung tablet in, like, I'm not going to know what to do. And, and I think about that, like, once, you know, we have Alexa in our house, which is Amazon, of course. But I wonder, you know, when, when things get smarter, and they are going to get smarter, are we going to have, you know, the Amazon houses, which already exist? Are we going to buy a Google house? Are we going to buy an Apple house? Like, there are implications, right, for what kind of household you're going to be. And, you know, and, and what if your parents don't have the same, same household preference, right? Or they might be in a country that is a lot more Android. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think about that. I wonder about that and how, you know, I wonder about the shared experience, you know, the global shared experiences that we've shared in the past. Like, are those even still possible? Because it looks like everyone's looking at things from a different lens. And if you go into that world of Google AR and Facebook AR, and we all have completely different lenses, literally, like that is just going to impact our sense of shared experience. I, I like the idea of talking about democracy here. You know, mm -hmm. this should be accessible to everyone. It, it, it's like you, when you go back to your, your first sort of, your, your XR origin story with CNN and you put on the headset and it was like, well, it's storytelling. And from a journalistic perspective, and I, I had a similar experience about three or four years ago in the, in the Vancouver International Film Festival um, with the team from Al Jazeera. Mm -hmm. I think they were based in Amman and, and they were there and, and, and it was like suddenly I was in this, in this experience in you know, a war-torn war or sort of civil war-torn uh, part of Nigeria and other parts of Africa. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I was somewhere else and it was like, oh, how do we get this into the hands of everyone, right? And, and then it seems to be like, oh, headsets cost X and you need X amount of hardware to run it. And, yeah. you know, people don't have access to three to $5,000, you know, across the board. So how do you make that democratic? I haven't seen them I haven't seen sways of VR banks and libraries or, or anything like this. There's, there's, there's sort of a, a, a disbelief. But I, have, you, have you seen the, uh, the video by Keiji Matsuda, Hyperreality? Yes. What yeah. not to do. What we don't want to happen. Yes. Ah, <laughs> do the but, opposite. <laughs> so Keiji Matsuda is super interesting. I think he's based in, in the UK and uh, he, he was working with Leap Motion. I'm not exactly sure what he's doing now, but I've been following him, um, you know, you know what's it? Uh, augmented reality um, Robocop was one of the first things, or virtual reality ro Robocop, as it was called. Um, but like hyperreality is this twisted gamified world but where everyone has got access to these headsets and suddenly you're following this woman that's having self-help advice on a bus and they're in Medellin in Colombia, which feels very raw and real. It's a country that's really starting to bloom out of the back of some pretty heavy years, um, really violent years as well. Then you're in the supermarket, then you're back on the street and then violence impacts her life. And I'm not going to spoil the story for everyone, but the reboot is kind of an ironic thing that can happen to everyone. And there's a democracy there which is like, you know, the average person on the street and their belief systems and their loyalty systems and their aspirations are enabled by this headset. It's a constant bombardment of advertising as well. I mean, is that, is, is that the holy grail? Is that where we're going to land? Because advertisers kind of screw up the, you know, they kind of screwed up the internet. They've kind of screwed up mobile. It's all about beacons and geofencing and advertising and that dollar amount mm -hmm. for your attention and it's not the democracy that i voted for sell 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 right um i you know i i think about it and it worries me if we were going to have that type of reality it worries me the haves and have nots let's say the concept of i can pay an amount to not be able to see ads because i don't want to i've got more money Right, and I don't have to see them, and um, and, and and kind of creating that further divide between who you know who gets access to what. 
Um, there's actually a sci-fi comedy out right now called Upload. It's yes. on Amazon Prime. And exactly, and, and you know, I'm not gonna kind of go into into it too much. It is fantastic, very interesting and thought provoking. Not everything is 100% right, but it's very thought provoking. And it's basically this young man that gets his brain gets uploaded to the cloud when he dies, and when he's in this like virtual place where he's you know his his place of rest, which is a beautiful you know be beautiful chateau, and who knows, but um, he's in this in, you know in this cloud. Uh, in you know, and uh, in order for him to purchase certain things, he has to pay, right? So you know, even if he wants to, you know, even if he wants to eat a fake burger, he's got to pay up. Uh, so so even you know, you think about that concept of like, is this gonna follow us in, into the afterlife? This is insane when you start to think about it. Um, you know, from an advertising perspective, because I do come from a marketing and communications background. I look at kind of what's happening right now with advertising budgets and marketing budgets, and they're all getting slashed, right? Companies are holding on to their money. They're like, I'm, you know, I'm not ready for a campaign or an activation. I hope that this, that what, what's happening is going to change the ad industry in some positive ways. That's my hope. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, right? But that's my hope, um, that it's going to change the way things have been doing, you know, the way we have been doing business, you know? So yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, is is it still strategic to spend two million dollars on a TV advertisement? I don't know. I think that you could actually use that money and do more social content and potentially try to do some social good. I mean, I, it's just chicken and chicken and the egg problem. It's kind of weird. I, I come from an ex-advertising background as mm -hmm. well, right? I, I came from data and some spooky stuff in between and then <laughs> ended up in advertising. And, yeah, will advertising change? Well, it's about stories. When I worked for advertising agencies, I, I would reason with them of the smart way to spend money and to look at innovation and new ways of doing things. And the bottom line was it was it was impact and TV and radio and how much coverage we can get and how many awards that we can win. And, and, and the story stopped when the person picked up the thing that they got and they, the smile on their face. And, and that was it. You know, um, I used to work with a creative director and every year I worked for this one client and, uh, and it'd be like, OK, it's Christmas. We need to tell a human story. And this is how advertisers <laughs> think. And, it, it, and, and the guy and the, the, the creative director that I worked with was. Right, we need to find the crippled kid, or we need to find this sob story, or we need to find, and you know, it, it's screwed up. The, the advertising world is screwed up. It's like, we need that special moment. And by finding one special moment, you're ignoring the, the, the point of everything, right? And it's like, how about we, we don't go for one special moment and we go for five million kind of useful everyday moments that really make everyone feel a little bit better about that like one or two minutes in that day yeah but maybe I'm that's maybe that. that's the opportunity here with mixed reality and, and i do think it is i mean i think that ar and vr can make you feel things that you might have not felt in a long time or make you connect to something um so yeah i think there's an opportunity i think there was a i think it was ad age that had an article I was saying that people are starting to have um, pandemic advertisement uh, fatigue. Like there's only so many times like you can see something, um, you know, the car buy, like the same ad, like we'll give you 120 days. Like it gets to a point where it's like, okay, I get it. I get it. But you maybe, maybe I want to see a regular ad at some point uh, and feel like we're back to a new, you know, new normal or whatever, new future, <laughs> whatever people want to call it. Um, so yeah, my hope is that it'll change, you know, things get contracted, change happens, hopefully for the best. And, you know, I tend to be positive. Things. Um, we'll see. Yeah. We'll, yeah, it's we'll see. Yeah, advocacy, right? I mean, we, we talk in, I think it was the McKinsey loyalty loop and advocacy, <laughs> creating advocates and all this good stuff. And as a strategist, as well as a futurist, I'll push this out. I used it in a presentation a couple of weeks ago with a client and it makes a lot of sense as a framework. I, I love this idea. You can feel something. It can heal you. It can just make that little part of the day that's that's kind of painful right now a, a little easier. So, mm -hmm. if we look out, so, okay, let's take let's look at a horizon. Let's look at a twenty year horizon, right? Twenty forty. You know, we're on our third pandemic. 
no. Uh, anyway, we, we're in we're, a third pandemic. We're a touchless society. We don't touch anyone or anything. Well, yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, but, but what, what 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 does the world truly look like? Uh, I mean, like let let's flex some of these futurist muscles, right? These foresight mm -hmm. muscles. What does that day look like for someone in 2040? You know, I think from in let's say from a digital content perspective, I, I would assume that by then we will have either really good consequences or even implants. Um, you know, that's a, that's a very hard problem to solve. But you know, by 2040, I'm I'm almost positive we're you know potentially going to resolve that. Um, right. So you know, some type of um, element that we put in our eyes or that is implanted, we're going to have this digital content in front of us. So for sure, um, you know, I, I, I really, you know, after last week, and I'll tell you why, after last week, I really do feel we're going to have fine cars. Um, <laughs> and the only reason I'm saying that is because oh, last week I participated in like, it was like three days of an event put on together by Agility Prime, which is owned by AppWorks, the U.S. government, uh, talking about flying cars. Mm. The whole three days. People from NASA, NASA, people from, you know, from everywhere. It was just incredibly interesting to watch this and be like, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've been waiting for them. That doesn't really, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to look like the ones from the Jetsons. Um, but, but definitely, you know, I foresee that. Um, I, I wonder about the, the makeup of families, you know, as a mom, um, I wonder about the makeup of families and what is that going to look like in 2040? Is it still going to be the concept of uh, mom, dad, kids um, when you're in 2040 and you're able to um, digitally bring grandma in whenever you need advice? Um, you know, the, the, how does that change the, the makeup of a family and the makeup of, of legacy and identity, right? I've got friends, this day and age, 2020, right? Uh, working as digital legacy consult, digital legacy consultants in Hollywood, um, because they're trying to help these Hollywood stars figure out who owns their digital legacy, their tweets, their up, like their videos, anything they've said. You know, what if they want to become, uh, come back as a hologram? Uh, you know, can they be replicated as an AI, etc.? So um, I think that that's a new thing uh, to watch. Uh, what does that do for the makeup of a family? If you can, you know, grandma passed away in 2030, but you can bring her, you know, she can always come uh, talk to her granddaughter in 2040. Um, so yeah. Or if you lose a child, um, can they live on, um, you know, can they live on with you in the form that they died uh, as a hologram? Or, yeah. um, I think it just raises a lot of questions of, you know, even, even will people even have children, right? If they can have, holographic children and they don't need to physically go through the, <laughs> go through the experience of childbirth um yeah i think it'll be really interesting or partners or relationships it, it, it's almost like a, you, you're describing something that it, it's almost like a new shamanism is going to exist in the world it, it's like the new religions I, I don't know if you've ever read the um the comic book trans um transmetropolitan no, I haven't. Yeah. I'm gonna check okay. it out. Go, go and read it. So it's it's about the future. It multiple religions, multiple realities. Uh, it, there, there's um, a new way of journalism. Um, you know, maker bots at home addicted to the, the drugs that they produce. A whole bunch of stuff. Uh, protagonist called uh, Spider Jerusalem. Protagonist stroke hero stroke. I don't know. Nemesis of of the world. You know, the the people are called the new scum. You know, we're just like the, the common denominator, but we've got access to all this technology. But it kind of feels like th this new world with flying cars and technology mm -hmm. and this new way and implants and transhumanism and, you know, it all sounds, it, it's not, it doesn't sound science fiction to me because I've been speaking about it for a long time. I've got microchips in my hand. I, I play with this stuff. You know, th there's worlds of, of, of psychedelics and everything mm -hmm. that's getting super interesting. But it feels like a world that's, you know, there's still going to be those people that have. And the, peop and the people that have are the people that have safe places to live and the technologies to make them superhuman. And you're going to have people on the ground floor that are going to be even in, in an even worse position, maybe yeah. using public accessible technology banks or whatever. 
to try and scrape their way by in a world that's excluding them every, even more, right? Yeah, I, I hope for, for you, know, for humanity's sake, I hope that that's not what happens, but you know, there is always that threat, right? And we see it nowadays up, uh, I, I don't know, you know, that's, that's a tough one. I also think of, you know, we have server farms right now, but like, when do we start, when are, do those become human farms, right? Where we're farming their thoughts, um, you know. Now that we're getting weird, right? <laughs> now that we're getting yeah, no, weird, we, we, we're getting we're interface, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm excited about it, but in a very negative prognosis. Let's say if we were look out further into the future, into potential futures, what happens when you know? Let's say this goes in a very negative way, and you actually start having human farms to form their intention and their thoughts, right? So, so yeah. It, there are definitely implications, you know, I, will it happen? Uh, I'm not sure, you know, we, I, you know, I, all we can do, I think, is look at the potential futures and try to figure out, you know, how would you prepare for X alternative future, right? How would you prepare for other alternative future? What's the baseline? You know, is there a baseline? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, farming people would be pretty crazy, but I wouldn't put it past humans. Well, you know, we're already looking at um, the ability to farm pigs to grow human organs, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, you know, we're already looking at a world with uh, human DNA being, or DNA being able to be used as a data storage mechanism. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, again, augmented reality. This, this, this world where, you know, we, we can't touch and feel the things uh, that we see around us, but we can feel it deeply in our hearts and in our minds, right? And that brings us also, like, I want to talk about the concept of a touchless society. Right. Because if right now, if I'm going out, I don't want to touch anything, right? And how, what does that do to us long term? Um, you know, if you think about children in an orphanage, there's been studies done about the children that didn't get hugged and didn't get, get you know, snuggled. In it. And like, what that, imp what that imp how that impacted them as humans in developing empathy or this and that. And, you know, if, if we become a touchless society, what does that do to our humanity, right? Um, so yeah, I've been giving, that's been in my mind, uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about that lately. Yeah, and epigenetics, right? It's passed mm -hmm. down and I, I've done a bunch of uh, personal work and, uh, and therapy and whatever, where, you know, literally reprogramming the memories that are held in our, in our cells, mm -hmm. you know? Because um, we carry down from our mothers and our fathers and their mothers yeah. and fathers and whatever. And I've done like breath work and I've done interventions and you, you end up in a really, you know, when we're talking about a virtual reality, you, I think the brain, we've already got, you know, the wetware, which is our brain mm -hmm. to, to realize that. Um, a lot of us think that we need to put um, technology on our heads to get there. I, I was just watching the, a um, trailer for a documentary on, on Netflix about psychedelics. And there's all these people saying about how everything changes and how you know the world of psychedelics has actually become you know more relevant today because it's starting to come back into society. It was originally mm -hmm. castigated because you know the, the kids got a hold of it and it was freedom of thought. And now that freedom of thought is liberating us from you know trauma and whatever. And uh, and even we've seen that virtual reality, augmented reality, and and the release of trauma. But that this touchless society, I think it. Yeah, it, I was chatting to neighbors over, over the road. I moved into my, my new house with my, uh, with my partner and um, we chatted to our neighbors at a distance for about eight mm -hmm. weeks now. We've never shaken their hands or, you know, I don't think we were at the point of giving them a hug anyway, but do you know what I mean? We can't invite, <laughs> yeah. them, over, we can't invite them over for tea or coffee, right? We, we, one of my friends stood in my garage the other day yeah. And now I'm converting. I realized, I was like, ah, I'm going to convert the entire side of my garage into uh, a virtual bar. And, and I'm literally, there's going to be like a bar and I'm going to set it up and they're going to have their own drinks at one end, my own drinks. I've got my stereo system. And once the weather gets better, rock and roll. Lysol wipes on both sides. So you can disinfect. <laughs> 
I love it. I mean, I, love I, mean, we, I mean, we live in an extraordinary reality with the pandemic and however long it's going to last. And I've still got people trying to book me for things and whatever, but virtual reality, augmented reality, this new way of thinking, it's very exciting to talk to you about all of these eventualities. And, and we've been talking and talking and talking, but I think, I think we probably need to do a separate chapter to go, mm -hmm. you know, maybe give it a year and then revisit a lot of these ideas and, and what has happened. What, what, what are some of the biggest questions that you have for the world right now with regards to this new you know, virtual world that we can, we can build? I'm interested in seeing how it gets implemented into education. Um, I think that education is, you know, is ripe for disrupt disruption. And now with the pandemic, it's like been obvious that if you were not doing any virtual planning, you should have been. Um, it'll put, you know, it'll, it'll, it, it's going to change the paradigm. You know, if, if, if my children were older and they were going off to college next semester, would I be dishing out, you know, putting down 50 K uh, to have them go to university if it's online, you know, probably not. Um, so I think it's, it's going to be interesting. Um, I, I did want to say something because I think this is very relevant to the conversation that we're having. Yeah. Is that, um, and you, you like me, you test out a lot of these technologies, right? I, I haven't been microchip. I might, I don't know, still on the fence on that one. Um, I would microchip, you know, I always tell my, my husband, like, I would definitely microchip our children. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> um, but because we are out there testing all these technologies and everything, I've been, I've had a chance to test out a lot of the brain computer interfaces, the external ones, you know, not Neuralink, which is internal. And that's a whole other, you know, whole other dimension. Um, but I've tried out the external ones, um, like NextMind, Neurosity, um, Neurable, all these companies are doing fantastic stuff. And this is my finding so far. I enjoy it thoroughly. You have to be highly concentrated. You have to be focusing and concentrating. I love that. But every time I think about these machines and using them and going into this, you know, into this world and using my thoughts, my brain lights up. Like if you were going to put sensors on me, it'd be like, Ooh, you know, <laughs> cocaine or whatever. It'd be like yeah. totally lighting up and excited. I don't know if it's because my brain likes to work out or what it is, but I feel this, like I get excited, like the dog salivating because of the treat. That's how I feel when I think about putting on one of these machines and scrolling my iPad with my mind or putting in a code using just my thoughts. It, my brain really, really likes it. And I'm trying, trying to think about, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I, yeah. I mean, societal control. It's it's the dopamine kick that we get from someone liking a, a photo on Instagram, right? It's it's a mm -hmm. continual thing. And will this new technology will it will it will it have worked out a way to for this to be normal and not to override our senses algorithmically in a way mm -hmm. that's actually potentially damaging? Mental health is is probably a bigger concern today than it was three months ago, and even three months ago. Uh, I did a study with, uh, with with a partner company, Intentions, and my great friend Nick Black, and uh, and we found that the majority of American young Americans, you know, um, they they were stressed, depressed, and about thirty percent of them self-identified as narcissists. Right? It's it, like how do we, you know, how do we liberate ourselves? But I, I you know, I, I'm aware that we've been talking for a long time. And I've got a feeling that we have to talk about this um, a little bit in, in another episode because yes. I, I, I think that, and what I'd like to do actually is get a few of us on the same call to discuss yes. this because yeah, what, what is the world that we are creating and, and how are we going to suddenly uh, decide to create a world that's good for humans versus good for the shareholders mm -hmm. and, and good for someone that's a, a billionaire um, denying the existence of, uh, of pandemics or wanting to move to Mars or whoever, right? Anyway. Or whoever it is. <laughs> <laughs> whoever it is, Kathy. Better future well, for our children. There you go. <laughs> yeah, a better future for all of our children. And I'm going to be a father in about two months. So, like, uh, you know, it, it gives me the impetus to, to push mm -hmm. a little harder. So, Kathy Hackle, incredible you know, technology evangelist, the most excited person I've met. Uh, for new technologies uh and you let me use your magic leap headset when we first met yes. within like five minutes i was like give me that you're like take it and uh you know so suddenly it wasn't what i thought i wanted to see but it's interesting because 
this technology takes us into new new places and new directions. Mm-hmm. And Kathy Hackle, you're one of the people guiding us in 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 those ways. So I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us on the Exponential Minds podcast today. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it. And it, it, you know, people can connect with me on LinkedIn if they want to kind of uh, see some of the crazy stuff I'm doing and fun stuff I'm sharing. Um, always a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, absolutely. We'll put links to all of that in uh, in the description, Kathy, and uh, I'll speak to you very very soon.